blessed day, the dark sacred night, and I think to Thank you, Christina English and John Moratori, for that beautiful music. Welcome, and thank you for joining us on this special, special day. Today, we are installing our second chaplain for the Institute, the Reverend Kirsten Boswell Ford. And we are already so grateful for your leadership. I'd like to highlight some of your many accomplishments in the short time that you have been here. In one year, you have inspired a new vision for the office, which has been renamed the Office of Religious, Spiritual, and Ethical Life. You've partnered with the chaplains to plan many new initiatives that have helped those in our community, the religious and non-religious alike, to feel more welcomed and affirmed. And since your arrival, you've diversified our chaplaincies, including bringing a new humanist chaplain, a first for MIT. And this has expanded the chaplain's reach to include those who identify as atheist and agnostic and secular and humanist. And during the new Mondays in the Chapel series, something that you have implemented, You've engaged members of our community in thinking about how resiliency and flourishing and gratitude play an important role in our lives. You've brought in the understanding of the role of being a chaplain on our campus, and it includes supporting students and members of our community in their well being and their daily lives. And to the chaplains group, you've added our first advisor for LBGTQ support, helping us to engage more fully with our increasingly diverse community. So in a very short time, Reverend Boswell Ford, you have had a very positive impact. Thank you for your vision, for your compassion, and for all that you have done for MIT. It is now my pleasure to introduce the 17th president of the Institute, Raphael Reif. Thank you, Susie. Uh, Reverend, I guess I'm ahead of you. I'm number 17, you're number two, so you have a long way to go to catch up with me. Good afternoon. It is my great honor to be part of this joyful occasion. I'd like to start by recognizing the family of Reverend Boswell Ford, including her mother and father, Mr. William and Dr. Gracie Boswell, her husband, Reverend Paul Robson Ford, and their three children with us and a friend. To all the members of your family, please accept our warmest welcome 
from the family of MIT. And to everyone here, your presence is a wonderful expression of the strength and vitality of our community. Thank you so much for joining us today. As Dean Nelson described, in a little more than a year, Reverend Postle Ford has already made important contributions to the life of our community, and we're grateful. At this moment of her official installation, I will simply offer a few observations about the strength of that community and how I hope that our new chaplain can help us grow stronger and wiser still. We live in a noisy time, a time that favors instant opinions delivered in 280 characters, an angry, cynical time in which many people are careless with the truth. If it's awful, it's exhausting, and sometimes it nearly breaks your heart. But when I feel worn out by all the terrible noise and distraction, I take great inspiration in thinking about our community at MIT. Because I'd like to believe MIT is different. MIT can be noisy too, but it's mostly the noise of bright, curious people testing old assumptions, coming up with new ideas, and trying to understand each other. At MIT, we have lots of opinions, but they are usually thoughtful, sometimes even wise. And we're interested in hearing what other people think as well. Sometimes we get frustrated, even angry. But the sound of all of that, for the most part, is a positive noise because it's the sound of all of us together working to serve MIT's meaningful mission. As for cynicism, to me, cynicism could be a sign of defeat. It could be a sign that you have lost faith in human goodness and possibility and lost faith in our creative power. By that definition, MIT is the opposite of cynicism. I'm grateful for this community's practical optimism every day. And perhaps for this home audience, I don't need to explain that at MIT we're very careful with the truth and we are all about facts. In short, in this difficult time, I'm grateful for the way we live and work together at MIT. I'm proud that we do not fear the world. As one can see any day in the infinite corridor, in a real sense, MIT reflects what is good about the world. Our openness to talent from every faith, culture, and background is central to our success. We should never forget the value and strength of this idea. I'm proud that our community, our MIT community, does not shy away from reassessing itself, experimenting with new ideas, and seeking to improve. I'm grateful that we seek to find the answers through candor and collaboration. And I'm deeply proud that we shoulder the responsibility to help make a better world. Over the past few years, however, through the brave, persistent work of many people, including many of you, and certainly including Reverend Boswell Ford, we have come to see that if we aim to make a better world, we must constantly strive to make a better MIT. We must aspire to treat one another always with sympathy, humility, decency, respect, and kindness. We must strive to support each other in the struggles of life and work. And we must find the courage to reach out with compassion to those we do not yet understand. We must always, always take the time to listen. 
We must make sure that our community is a place for fairness and equity for all. And as an institution centered on science and technology, we must take care that the work we do in the world is elevated and enriched by the highest human wisdom. 50 years ago, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. published a book of sermons. He called it From Strength to Love. At that time, before the moon landing, before the personal computer, before the internet and the smartphone, before gene editing, before machines that learn, Dr. King cautioned that, in his words, our scientific power has outrun our spiritual power. Today, in this time and place, Dr. King's warning remains intensely relevant. Yet knowing the people of MIT, I'm optimistic. I believe that as a community, we do have the capacity to achieve the wisdom we need. I'm equally sure, however, that we will not achieve that wisdom automatically. And in this great endeavor, I have no doubt that Reverend Boswell Ford will be essential to our success. Kirsten, in this solemn and joyful day, congratulations. May you find the strength to lift us up to be our best selves. And may we all together succeed in making a better MIT and a better world. Let your light shine through the universe 
reading by Amitabh Ghosh. I believe that our political, economic, and financial institutions are becoming impotent. They don't have the moral depth or the practical forms to do much. But religions, religions transcend nations and generations, and they have a moral and spiritual depth that can critique and redirect other ways of being. Moreover, at their best, these traditions call people out of their interior myopic obsessions and into service for the common good. Religions call people to an acceptance of limits, and without an acceptance of limits to human ambition, there is no way out of our planetary crisis. What we need are traditions and practices. Traditions and practices that will enable us to transcend the isolation in which humanity is entrapped. And that, that will help people rediscover their kinship with other beings. such a joy to be here today, and congratulations to you, Kirsten, and to MIT from all your neighbors next door at Tufts. Um, the second reading is a combined reading from All Mysteries and All Knowledge in the Inward Journey by Dr. Howard Thurman, and from We Can Help This Troubled World by Pema Chodron. We are made for wholeness, body, mind, spirit, one creative synthesis, moving in perfect harmony within, without, with fellow humans, and with nature all around. We all have the inborn wisdom to create a wholesome, uplifted existence for ourselves and others. We can think beyond our own little cocoon and try to help this troubled world. Not only will our friends and family benefit, but even our enemies will reap the blessings of peace. If these teachings make sense to us, can we commit to them? In these times, do we really have a choice? Do we have the option of living in unconscious self-absorption? When the stakes are so high, do we have the luxury of dragging our feet? So I'm observing. Hi. Um, we're the MIT Cross Products, and the song we'll be singing for you is called Beloved by Jordan Felice. Full of 
questions how can you measure up to deserve affection to ever be wow. enough for this existence when did it get so hard your heart is beating alive and breathing and there's a reason why you are essential not accidental you should you to know you are beloved let it soak into your soul sometimes our heart can feel like a heavy weight it pulls you under and you just fall away is anybody gonna hear you call but there's a purpose under the surface and you don't have to let me remind you that love will find you let it lift you out you are beloved i wanted you to know you are beloved let it soak into your soul whoa forget the lies you heard rise above the hurt Don't let hope fade, keep your eyes fixed on the light above. In the heartbreak, in your mistakes, nothing can separate you from love. Don't be afraid, don't let hope fade, keep your eyes fixed on the light above. In the heartbreak, in your mistakes, nothing can separate you from love. I know they're walking out of the room, but they are fabulous, right? Woo! Thank you. What an enormous pleasure it is for me personally to be here to um, have faces and names to attach to a family of MIT to whom the family at Brown gladly and with great respect and enormous regard send our dear sister Kirsten Boswell Ford to be your chaplain. So it's a year late, she's already been working really hard, um, but we're really, really um, so honored to be able to claim any part in her story um, prior to her joining this wonderful family. So thank you all for welcoming her here. Um, I can only tell you from our experience of her time with us at Brown, the blessings have only begun. I want to tell you about my very first invitation to MIT. I'm not sure why this came to mind, and maybe you'll think it makes sense by the time I'm done. It happened in the early 1970s. I was an undergraduate. You have these things here that we don't have so much of at Brown called fraternities, and they have parties. This was a pledge party, 
I can't tell you which frat it was, but I do know that when we got there, the pledges, who were my date and others, they were really nervous. They had a job. It was called an installation, and maybe that's where this idea came from. It was their task to meet the requirements of the brothers and install a working machine that was able to do a set of tasks. It only had to do it once. They had a fixed budget for what they had been allowed to spend to create this machine. And I have to tell you, looking at it, um, I wasn't so sure. There were drinking straws and strings and marbles and, um, as I remember, a gerbil in a wheel, but I might have made that part up. <laughs> and then there was the moment, glasses were raised, and a mighty challenge was uttered. And that machine, which needed to have the number of moving parts of the class that they were part of. So I think it was the class, 73 moving parts. And the only task I can remember that the machine needed to do, I'm embarrassed to tell you as the chaplain, was that it needed to stir a martini. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, so it did. Um, and honestly, the entire thing fell into shambles on the floor as it finished its tasks and a roar went up and the pledge class was accepted. And I suppose maybe they felt what that song we just heard um, was intended to convey. They were beloved and they were welcomed and things went on. It was a nice evening. Um, I, I found myself thinking about installations. I, I don't know if it strikes you funny. We do this to clergy. Um, I was recently at the induction of my other Brown colleague, as she became the president at Williams, um, these are weird things to do to people, right? I mean, are we backing Kirsten up to the wall and inserting a plug? Um, is it some task that, like those pledge brothers of old, she's to make a certain set of tasks happen on a very small budget um, with a certain number of <laughs> moving parts and it only has to work once? Um, I, I have to tell you, in my long time service as chaplain of universities, this does seem to me to be quite what we're asked to do from time to time. But I want to say something really quite serious, and my uh, lyrics for my song today are borrowed from Alexander Hamilton. This is the room where it happens. I mean quite literally, this one. We are together today to install the second chaplain to the Institute, which strikes me as quite a momentous occasion. Um, it's been a privilege for me in the last year to get to know a little bit about what MIT intends for itself spiritually and inclusively in terms of the diversity of this community and its extraordinary tasks. But I found myself back, literally, I admit to loving that musical, Alexander Hamilton, and if you haven't seen it yet, just somehow scrape together the shekels to get there or agree to stand in that line in New York City that goes on forever because it's the cheapest ticket I know. Alexander Hamilton, did Washington know about the dinner? Was there presidential pressure to deliver? Alexander to Aaron Burr. Or did you know, even then, it doesn't matter where you put the US Capitol, because we'll have the banks. We're in the same spot. You've got more than you gave, and I wanted what I got. When you got skin in the game, you stay in the game, but you don't get a win unless you play in the game. Oh, you get love for it. You get hate for it. You get nothing if you wait for it, wait for it, wait. God help and forgive me, I want to build something that's going to outlive me. What do you want, Burr? What do you want, Burr? If you stand for nothing, Burr, then what will you fall for? Never, ever have those questions been more important in this nation. What will we stand for? What will we fall for? You've heard your president say, this is a place where facts matter, where every question will be taken up. The poet laureate of the United States, Tracy Smith, 
writes about the everlasting self. It's very brief. You might decide, as I did, that this is one to memorize. Just in, take, in case we're taken captive, there are things we should know. Comes in from a downpour, shaking water in every direction, a collaborative condition, gathered, shed, spread, then forgotten, reabsorbed, like love from a lifetime ago, and mud a dog has tracked across the floor from wade in the water. Comes in from a downpour, shaking water in every direction, a collaborative condition, the things that we must shoulder in this time. The room where it happens is this day, this time, this generation, this place, this school, and every place where each of us is. There is nothing else. Each of these places, in my language, a gift from God. This day, my privilege to speak to you, our privilege to be here as Kirsten steps into this task, installed to be sure, but much more importantly, carried forward in this downpour that's as tangible as the mud the dog shakes all over the kitchen. My dog, maybe not yours. But a collaborative condition, gathered, shed, spread, then forgotten, reabsorbed, like love from a lifetime ago. We're not doing this alone. It is a wonderful life. There are things we know about what we feel and see that tell us that things we're being told we shouldn't fall for. They're not right. And at times, that knowledge does not come from the laboratory. It can't be demonstrated in data. It's what the Quakers have been saying for a very long time about education. Do you know this one? Fundamentally, it's more important to be good than it is to be smart. Oh, we say that, but I have a feeling if I track over to your admissions office <laughs> or to Brown's, every time we look at 100 candidates, we send 93 of them packing and you do worse. We hear about the student we see in application that we think, oh, that student's going to MIT. No point in taking her. We see how difficult we make it for people to be good when, in fact, we stress so much what it is in quantitative, measurable, robotic, do I say that, ways it takes to be smart. Demonstrating that over and over and over again, it's far from simple to even know what the good is, let alone how to be it. It isn't good enough, is it, for us to be in each generation, in each moment, in each chapter, in each verse, technically better. And yet, to get technically better, so that we could determine what the good is, is a lot of time. It's a lot of practice. It's a lot of research. And that's what we come to places like this to do. And we're right to come, or at least so I think. We have our detractors. There are those out there saying higher education is just one of those things that costs a lot of money and isn't worth much. Creates an elite in society that actually doesn't care about the common good. And I don't know about MIT's sound, but at Brown, those voices have come to study. They're asking us right inside the university, is this worth it? Am I doing the right thing with my life? Am I called in my generation to spend hours and hours and hours practicing something? I don't know what answer you give. In my office, when somebody's discouraged about all that work, I usually do my best with a pot of tea and a lot of encouragement to say, absolutely. Absolutely, you should practice more. But the research about practicing says something else. 
It says it's not just about quantity. It's about quality. Time invested must be focused. It must be directional. It isn't enough. You know that business about 10,000 hours? That you have to have done something for 10,000 hours to be any good at it? Well, guess what? You can do it for more than that and be still no good. Because it takes improving particular aspects of what you're not good at. It must be focused. It must be, dare I say it, coached, taught. Which is precisely why we do our best, however flawed our admissions policies are, and I confess readily that they may be. We do our best to go out on the highways and byways as we look for students, but also as we look for chaplains and faculty, to find those who have practiced the hardest, who care the most, who are in search of the good, and to gather them. And then to say, as your president said to you just a few minutes ago, let us be a family. He didn't say, let us be a string of laboratories. Let us be a bunch of people that are working so hard we have no time to even speak to one another. He didn't say, let us be exhausted together, but I'm guessing you might be from time to time. We are. Let us be a family. This is the room where it happens. Hours and hours of practice for sure, but focused by things that matter, focused by goals and directions that are not about repeating the errors of the past, but where there is feedback from experts. The chaplain, not someone on the side of the endeavor, but at the heart of the endeavor. Feedback matters for the productivity that we want from our work. Of course, the chaplain will always be, I expect, at the edge, patching together those who are a bit beat up by the fray, because we will all be at the edge from time to time, beat up by the fray. It happens. The most central figures in universities are frequently the folks that I think are least thought of with compassion. And as I look out at the few of you I recognize, I want you to know that this is a person to whom you can turn for a compassionate heart, for a good conversation, a great cup of tea. We've even been known to have five-hour dinners. But the coaching that we will give each other to make of a place like MIT the family that it is striving to be is one that will better align it with human good. And in order to do that, we'll have to ask some hard questions about what it is we're seeking to be and do. So I take you backward in time. It's Tracy Smith's fault. She said that that human good is coming from behind. It's that love from former generations. So back I take myself to someone who's a favorite. She's not someone everybody talks about on the street. She's not nearly as cool as Alexander Hamilton. Hannah Arendt wrote a very difficult book in 1953. It came to be known as The Banality of Evil. But she took it as a journalistic assignment to go and hear the trial of Eichmann. She knew who he was. The whole world knew who he was the architect of human misery. But what she came back to tell us has made us argue and struggle ever since. Her words are very difficult, but I found myself immersed in them again as I thought, what is it that we're up against as universities, as places where technology and learning and research and a search for truth is still for me, however idealistic that sounds, a very good reason to get out of bed in the morning. Hannah Arendt suggested that no extreme evil is completely disconnected from the functional mechanisms, cultures, and subcultures of the world. She asked us to look close to home to find what was wrong, not out there, People resisted her understanding of Eichmann because she humanized him. She brought him much nearer than those of us who wanted to believe he was some demon, a devil with a tail and horns and clearly identifiable as evil. 
She said instead, this thing that can break out, as Elie Wiesel said, is very near. Very near. In this room, where we want so dearly for it not to be at all. She suggests that the world and the place where we collaborate can bring us to a place where we become insular and cordoned off from one another, or we can risk in our knowing the empathy of literally walking in the shoes of another. She could show you how the way the Nazi movement had cordoned itself off began with racism and went on with xenophobia and classism and discrimination against those with disability and those who were gay and those and those and those. She asked us to look hard at what it meant to other people. It's been years. She wrote that book long before I was at that frat party. I was barely in school. She wrote it after a war and a genocide that none of us will ever forget. But I think in our worst moments, we ask ourselves, what are we doing now? How are we engaging the lives of our brightest and best in this generation to ensure that we will never be so smug in what we're learning that we don't imagine that we could be cordoned off, cut away from human empathy in a way that might enable us to other others. It is our deepest human danger, and my psychologist friends tell me it is the most primary basic learning we do as babies. We must learn who will sustain life as infants. We cry at those who threaten us. So say the developmental psychologists. These are basic inbred ideas. We must push against the things that make us afraid and be willing to learn all that there is to learn no matter where it takes us. These are the brave statements of universities, but they're not just about laboratories. Thinking which is obligated to accommodate the situation of the other, writes Aunt errant, requires the totality of our human ability. It is the essence of our humanity. To understand and think about the world, one must be capable of stepping into the other's shoes. It calls for empathy, deeply emotive thought as opposed to sense of sentimentality, commitment, and the necessary imagination to project as far as possible your own personal experiences onto the other and imagine that she or he might be in as deep a need as you. This is the room where it happens. And every laboratory and classroom, every dormitory room, every fraternity is the place at MIT where it happens. And if you'll please come visit us at Brown, I'd love to show you where it happens there too. The privilege to do what we're doing today, to install a chaplain, but to agree together that we are being installed, that we are being careful about our moment in history, and that we will not permit it to be reduced to some way that we are other than others. It's even hard to say, isn't it? Of course there are people who aren't here, didn't get accepted, don't even like us, think in fact we're the problem. You've been watching in these last days as our government wrestles with things, it's so clear. We are deeply divided against one another. How then are we to avoid the danger that Arendt speaks about? I think it begins with this. Today, you're sitting there and I'm looking at you but together, we're not witnesses, we're participants. Kirsten's installation is our installation together in a new time in this place, and it's a new alliance of colleagues and friendship and ability and questions and concerns that could shape a generation here at the Institute, 
but far beyond this institute because this is a place with influence. We could do, as Alexander Hamilton suggests, we could, in fact, know that we've got to be in the room where it happens, that we're not going to give up our shot. We are going to be the folks who will step in and together will be with Kirsten when she says, God help me and forgive me. I want to build something that's going to outlive me. I hope we will all join her in singing that lyric in saying that line and knowing that the privilege to be here in some way can only be replied to by knowing those who are coming after us, those who will need to sit in these seats and receive this education, those who will be in some time to come, I pray a long way out, installed as the next chaplain to the Institute, who will build as you are building on the work of others. This is an enormous privilege we've received, but what a great joy and we are really honored to be in the room where it happens. May God bless you in all of it. Oh, 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 oh. 
protect you with an unselfish love that respects you. Oh, just call our name and we'll be there for you. Wow. So the vibrant, compassionate, ever-expanding heart of MIT's Office of Religious, Spiritual, and Ethical Life has been on full display this afternoon. And at the center of all of this is Reverend Kirsten Boswell Ford. Through her clear vision, exceptional leadership, and reservoirs of empathy, Reverend Boswell Ford is creating an unshakable foundation from which our students can apply their minds, hands, and hearts to making a better world. We are grateful for and lifted up by your service. Thank you. I would now like to ask Reverend Boswell Ford, Dean Nelson, and the MIT chaplains to join me at the lectern. It is my honor to articulate MIT's charge to you in your role as chaplain to the Institute and director of the Office of Religious, Spiritual, and Ethical Life. You are to be committed to advancing our students' education in the fullest sense by guiding their intellectual, social, physical, ethical, and spiritual development while nurturing and enhancing opportunities for reflection and growth for the entire MIT community across a dimension of face. Recognizing that MIT's religious, spiritual, and secular diversity is one of our community's greatest attributes. You are to promote equity, understanding, and collaboration across people of diverse identities, backgrounds, and beliefs. You are to work collaboratively with campus partners, affiliated chaplain colleagues, and staff in the Office of Religious, Spiritual, and Ethical Life to 
create a culture of care, inclusivity, respect, and social and ethical responsibility on campus. Be an integral part of the network that provides support for our students and make a meaningful contribution to the life of the Institute and its mission to develop individuals who will work wisely, creative, creatively, and effectively for the betterment of mankind. In times of tragedy or loss, you are to console and counsel individuals in need and help our community come together for comfort and support. And finally, you are to guide the entire MIT community in reflecting on how the enterprise of scientific research and technological invention can shape the world for good or ill, and drawing on the wisdom of our many religious, spiritual, and ethical traditions, you are to inspire members of our community to make sure that new discoveries and technologies will indeed make a better world. Reverend Boswell Ford, do you, in the presence of this gathering of students, faculty, staff, alumni, alumni, and friends, accept your charge from the Institute and commit yourself to this trust and responsibility? Yes, I do. Congratulations. It is my pleasure to install you as chaplain to the Institute on this day, September 28th, 2018. May you thrive in this work for many years, and thank you on behalf of our entire community for your dedication and commitment to making a better MIT. Chaplain Boswell Ford. In my capacity as the humanist chaplain at MIT, I want to thank you and say that it's really largely due to your visionary leadership that I'm here. I uh, have a poem in mind uh, every time I think about uh, one of my most favorite, most inspiring leaders. Uh, it's a poem by Marge Piercy. It's a kind of a secular Jewish liturgical poem. And you very much embody the spirit of this to me and this of you. So I want to read you a few lines. The people I love best jump into work head first without dallying in the shadows and swim off with sure strokes almost out of sight. I want to be with people who submerge in the task, who go into the fields to harvest and work in a row and pass the bags along, who are not parlor generals and field deserters, but move in a common rhythm when the food must come in or the fire be put out. The work of the world is common as mud. Botched, it smears the hands and crumbles to dust, but the thing worth doing well done has a shape that satisfies, clean and evident. Greek amphoras for wine or oil, Hopi vases that held corn are put in museums, but you know they were built to be used. The pitcher cries for water to carry and a person for work that is real. I'm Thea Keith Lucas, MIT's Episcopal Chaplain. Kirsten, we praise God for calling you 
to join this institute as its chaplain. Serve patiently and boldly, remembering that the work you are called to do is already held in God's strong and gentle hands. Stand firmly among those Jesus called the truly blessed, the poor, the powerless, and the persecuted. Follow the compass of your inmost heart, where the Spirit of God speaks the words of truth. As you listen, reflect, guide, and heal, may your joy overcome all discouragement. May your hope cast out all fear. And may you be sustained always by the God who loves you and calls you by name. Amen. I'm Sadananda Das, the Hindu chaplain at MIT. May today's installation ceremony of Christine Boswell for Ford as the chaplain to institute be abundantly blessed by the Lord Supreme. With your permission, in order to grace the special moment for everyone who have assembled here, may I recite two mantras, which are powerful transcendental sound vibration from the ancient Vedic scriptures. These are Sanskrit mantras, so I'll chant the first mantra followed by the English translation, and then the next mantra followed by the English translation. Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahano Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavabahai Tejasvinabadhi Tamastu Ma Vidvishabahai Om Shantihi Shantihi, Shantihi, Om. May we all be protected. May we all be nourished. May we work together with great energy. May our intellect be sharpened. Let there be no animosity amongst us. Om, peace, peace, peace. And the second mantra. Om, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. This transcendental sound vibration, this chanting of Hare Krishna, is directly enacted from the spiritual platform, surpassing all different levels of consciousness, emotional, physical, and intellectual. This mantra is a spiritual call to the Lord, meaning, O energy of the Lord, O Lord, please engage me in your loving service. I'm Rabbi Michelle Fisher, the Executive Director of MIT Hillel. What does Adonai, our God, require of us? To revere, to love, to serve with all our heart and soul and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 through 14. Our God and God of our ancestors, bless the leaders of MIT. Bless Reverend uh, uh, Kirsten Boswell Ford with wisdom, vigor, and understanding. Sustain her with your spirit. Grant that her labors be a blessing and always a source of blessing. And let us all say, Amen. First and foremost, I would like to say thank you. I'm not going to attempt to name everyone to whom I am thankful because I think that some would inevitably be left out and if so, I ask that you charge it to my uh, head and not to my heart. But thank you to our president and to Chancellor Barnhart and Vice President and Dean Nelson, my wonderful colleagues, Gus Burkett, 
and the diversity and community involvement team, and so many others across the Institute that have reached across boundaries of divisions and departments to fully embrace me and our joint work for this great institution. Thank you to Gail Gallagher and the wonderful team and Institute events that made this day possible. To the chaplains, to the chaplain conveners, and to my ever steady assistant, Christina English. It is my honor to count you all as colleagues. I do indeed feel blessed to have my family here and many friends who are like family in the very truest sense of the word. Thank you to my chaplain colleagues from Tufts, from Wellesley, and from Brown who participated in this program and are truly, truly partners in this journey. One of my favorite lyrics from the work of Canadian singer and songwriter, poet and novelist, Leonard Cohen, is taken from his song, Anthem, which he penned over the course of an entire decade. The phrase, a powerful and meaningful message for our time, is this. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. When I was leaving my role at Brown University to come here to MIT in 2017, Reverend Janet Cooper Nelson and the Office of the Chaplains in Religious Life gave me a wonderful gift which hangs in my office and which I read often, especially during difficult times. I have since heard it referred to as a manifesto for our time. Influenced by Leonard Cohen's anthem, illustrator Wendy McNaughton and writer Courtney E. Martin composed the following, which seems especially poignant for this moment in our history and her story. Feel all the things. Feel the hard things, the inexplicable th things, the things that make you disavow humanity's capacity for redemption. Feel all the maddening paradoxes. Feel overwhelmed, crazy, feel uncertain, feel angry, feel afraid, feel powerless, feel frozen, and then focus. Pick up your pen, pick up your paintbrush, pick up your damn chin. Put your two calloused hands on the turntables, in the clay, on the strings, Get behind the camera, look for that pinprick of light. Look for the truth. Yes, it is a thing, it still exists. Focus on that light, enlarge it. Reveal the fierce urgency of now. Reveal how shattered we are, how capable of being repaired, but don't lament the break. Nothing new would be built if things were never broken. A wise man once said, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Get after that light. This is your assignment. According to our mission, this institute is committed to generating, disseminating, and preserving knowledge, and to working with others to bring this knowledge to bear on the world's great challenges. Embracing our diversity, we seek to develop in each and every member of the MIT community the ability and the passion to work wisely, creatively, and effectively for the betterment of humankind. That is the light that we are after. And it's no small task. The question is how. How to engage this awesome responsibility. In his writing, the late Dr. Howard Thurman described a sense of wholeness that lies at the core of every human being. This wholeness, he said, must abound in all that he or she does. And it is the end that each of us seeks throughout the course of our lives. I believe that this quest for wholeness needs to be at the center of what we do in the academy and should be the foundation for our work. The divided self is the unfulfilled and less abled self. 
But when we integrate the intellectual with the spiritual, the ethical, the emotional, the physical, when all of these pieces learn to truly work in concert with each other, that is when wholeness abounds. I'm so glad to be here at an institution that values this quality of the human condition, where inquiry and dialogue between faith communities and those in every location on the spectrum of religion, spirituality, secularity, ethical and moral engagement, where this dialogue can happen in a respectful and open manner, where we can all take away bits and pieces, ideas, knowledge, new and different questions, and we can incorporate them into ourselves, our understanding of ourselves and the world into our very particularity. This exchange then enriches us all. For you see, wholeness is not about us as individuals, but it's about others and the environment around us. Writing from a Birmingham jail, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. observed that we are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. As we prepare to leave this celebration, let us rejoice in this collective new beginning and go forth to change the world. Thank you. Thank you for those inspirational words, Reverend Boswell Ford, and thank you for being here um, at MIT. We are also so glad that you're with us. Thank you all for sharing your gifts of music and inspirational words and wisdom. Uh, we needed them on this, this afternoon. I hope you can continue uh, to join us in celebrating uh, Kirsten's installation out in the foyer outside of this auditorium. Thank you for being here. You'll see that my name is listed in the program, but I would like to pass this beautiful opportunity over to my brother, Vaughn Francis. <laughs> 